Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Texas Longhouse Me. I'm Carlos, and in case you haven't figured it out yet, this video is the Great Mead Project. Uh, this is where we're doing a recipe based off of a set of ingredients that uh, myself and 10 other YouTube brewers have come up with. And the whole point is to kind of see what we come up with, see how everybody differentiates, and see how it, it tastes. Let's get started. This week's meat is inspired by a set of ingredients that everybody agreed upon. And the ingredients are mangoes, peppers, corn, and one of two types of honey, which is either clover or wildflower. And I'm going with wildflower honey and I'm gonna go with purple corn. Now I found this recipe based off of a Peruvian drink called chicha, uh, but I modified it to go with the set of ingredients that you know we set for ourselves. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get this going and see you in the kitchen. For this recipe, we're gonna be mashing our corn. So we're gonna start with three gallons of water over a high flame and get that to a boil. This recipe is based off of a chicha drink, which uses purple corn. A lot of times they uh, take the corn, chew it up and spit it into a vat and ferment it, but we're gonna mash ours. I uh, bought six pounds of purple corn, and here we're just gonna take them off the cob since they're dry, just kind of twist them around and they'll fall right off. I bought two bags of this purple corn, and once we got all the kernels off the cob, we ended up with just over five pounds. Now we're gonna take our corn, put it into a blender. I'm using the Ninja blender here, uh, just because it has more contact with blades, and we're gonna do a rough chop on it, or a coarse grind on it, and I had to do several batches of this, pulsating it a couple times to get it to the consistency I wanted, as well as having to shake it from time to time. Some of it will turn to powder, which is fine, but really what you want to look for is a coarse grind like this. I put my corn into a brew bag and then boil that down for about 45 minutes. You'll want to pay attention and constantly mix this as everything will settle to the bottom. And you can scorch the mash, which will give you a burnt off nasty flavor. Or you could end up burning your bag if you're not constantly paying attention, moving it up and down so it doesn't stick to the bottom. Uh, once it Boiled for 45 minutes, I turned the flame down to low and just kept stirring it so it didn't burn. And then what you want to get it to is 155 degrees for this next step. Once you get to 155 degrees, you're going to want to add 7 grams of A-amylase enzyme, which helps break down the starches to dextrin, which will then use glucoamylase to convert the dextrin to sugars. So I let the A amylase sit at 155 degrees for two hours to help break down as much of the starches as I could. After that, I poured in this mango nectar juice that I got from the local grocery store. While this does have apple juice in it, I'm hoping that'll help add some of the acid balance to this, but we'll see. The pot's still hot, so you want to make sure you keep stirring this from time to time until it gets to a relatively lower temperature or closer to room temperature as possible as the corn sitting on the bottom of a hot pot can still scorch and give you that burnt flavor. Shout out to doing the most for bringing everybody together to do this collaboration. So with that, we're gonna stir, stir, stir. While mango isn't the primary ingredient for this recipe, I wanted the mango to come forward a little bit to kind of counteract the dryness that I believe that corn would give a mead. So here I have another six pounds of corn, uh, mangoes that I have frozen and thawed and had pectic enzyme added to it to help break it down some more. It's still a little cold here, so I'm putting it into the warm pot to help chill the pot a little bit more, as well as the hot water 
trying to extract as much of the sugars as I can out from the mangoes. We're going to let this sit for a little bit. Uh, coming back every once in a while to make sure we stir it just to get everything in there. Help break down these mangoes a little bit more and let it try to extract as much of the sugars out of the mangoes as we can. So I let the pot sit for several hours to extract all the sugars from the mangoes. Here, I'm just going to sanitize all our equipment before we rack out of the pot and into our fermentation vessel. Using a large mouth bubbler is I want to add some more mangoes to this during fermentation. Uh, I have it insulated with a heat blanket on as we're going to do a hot ferment with Kvike Hornendal. Our starting gravity before adding any honey or anything like that started out at 1.020 uh, and we're going to add our honey to that here in a moment. So unfortunately the rest of the video I had recorded somehow got lost, deleted or whatever so I don't have the video for the rest of it and it was kind of hard to kind of recreate everything that I had done with such limited time. But I did, however, manage to take pictures along the way so I can document everything and keep track of everything as I was doing to add later for social media and stuff. So I'll add that over here. Um, but once we brought it into the brew room and it cooled enough, I added roughly a quarter of an ounce or a bag of the amylase or glucoamylase to it, uh, which helps convert the dextrin to glucose, which is then fermentable. Uh, I added roughly four and a half pounds of honey to it to bring it up to a starting gravity of 1.076, which came out to about 10% uh, once fermented dry. I fermented it with a Hornendal Kvike uh, at what, 95 degrees and let that, and it finished roughly in two days, a little over two days. But there was a lot of sediment that I guess had gotten through the brew bag where there was a hole in it because the three gallons that I had ended up becoming just under two gallons with almost a gallon of sediment. Uh, part of that could have been just from using the, the mangoes, which created a lot of sediment and pulp as well, or the mango nectar, which with all the pectin haze that came out of it, probably didn't help any as well. But again, uh, once it fermented dry in roughly two, just over two days, uh, racked it off, let it sit for a little bit, aged a little bit, kind of mellow everything. It had an alcohol burn to it. Uh, again, it was young and fermented fast. And then after that, after sitting for about two weeks, I stable or I thought I had stabilized it. I added more mango because the mango wasn't quite where I wanted. And I ended up using a different kind of mango, the little yellow mangoes, because they didn't have the mangoes I normally use. Well, it started re-fermentation. Uh, couldn't tell you how much, because I, again, I thought, it had stabilized, but it didn't. I saw the airlock bubbling away, so I had to wait for that to finish fermenting. Stabilized it, made sure I stabilized it, and then add more mangoes. I ended up adding a total of, uh, for that gallon and a half, another four pounds of mangoes. <clears throat> so let that finish. Uh, once I had finished, I added two uh, habaneros that were frozen because when I picked them, they were fresh and I wasn't quite sure when I was going to add them. Uh, so once I added them, let that sit for 30 hours. 30 hours is all it took to add the habanero flavor and heat to it, but it's a good way. It didn't burn. It didn't, uh, it, it doesn't leave that long ring burning sensation on your tongue. Uh, after 30 hours and uh, it settling some more and clearing before it got completely clear, I back sweetened it a little bit, so about 10, 10, 10, 12, and then bottled it from there. And this is what we have here. I'll give you a quick rundown of it. Um, I don't get any corn off of it. It's very hard to pick up, but the mango does come through a little bit, but you do get the uh, habanero aroma that comes through for it. But let's try it. That's real good. The, the habanero doesn't, stick on the tongue it's actually in the throat is where you get the heat from it but it dissipates quick the sweetness from the mango the flavor of the mango is there not over 
mango-y flavor, but it's there. Um, I took it to a club meeting and people said that it had almost like a dried corn tortilla flavor to it uh, or mouthfeel to it, which I actually found interesting because I couldn't pick up the corn flavor at all. Uh, but when I told people, oh, it's purple corn, it might have led their perception to, hey, this is corn. So I don't know. But uh, I want to give a shout out to all the other mead makers out there that came together to do this collaboration. It was fun. It was different. Uh, definitely made me step outside of my comfort zone. So that was very interesting, unique for me. Uh, go check out all the other mead makers YouTube channels. I'll have them listed in the description along with their videos that go along with this. So hopefully you guys will give this a try at the end of the week, Saturday, Sunday. They doing the most we'll have the wrap-up video for it where we all come together and taste it so stay tuned for that and again if you haven't done so yet like and subscribe to the page it helps me out create more videos as well as uh get more attention and more uh views so again thank you and skull